Okay, it's on the hour, 6 p.m. in Central Europe and 9 a.m. In, in the U.S. I hope you had a really great eclipse, total eclipse day yesterday, uh, my friends in the U.S. Um, really cool to watch this all live on, on NASA and, you know, what it's like when sun stops shining forever, then winter is coming. Okay. So welcome to the Game of Graphs online meetup. So I'm really excited uh, about this. I've been reading the books for many, many years, I think 15 years or so, something like that, uh, since they first came out. And so I was also really excited when the uh, TV series came out, and I'm looking forward to every episode. Um, but before we start with the meetup, just a quick reminder, we have um, Graph Connect in October in New York. Hopefully, it won't be as cold there. And uh, the early bird was extended till August 31st. And if you're watching uh, here, you can use the Community 30 um, discount code to get 30% off, even of the early bird. And if you're a certified professional for Neo4j, you can get 50% off. So you should, should have got, gotten an email with that as well. OK, today we have here four people uh, talking about uh, Game of Thrones and graphs and all things around it. So I'll start um, talking about an API uh, of uh, the Game of Thrones uh, books, um, data sets, so people, families, uh, houses, and so on, and how you would import that into Neo4j, and then how you can expose this as a GraphQL endpoint, actually. Uh, then Tomas looks at the uh, Kaggle data set, um, which also contains like battles and who won which battle, and so on, and looks at graph algorithms on top of this data. Then uh, my colleague Will will look at uh, character interactions uh, that were extracted by um, uh, by Andrew Berridge uh, out of the um, Game of Thrones book series, and then um, look at what can these interactions tell us about like stories and how much can we kind of infer from the structure of the data about the real interactions in the books. And uh, Chris will uh, show us how to do something like this, actually, by using NLP on, on the book text. And we'll see how, how easy it is, actually, to extract entities and locations and activities out of the uh, actual text. And perhaps we might even hear something about the bot of graphs. I'm not sure. Let's see. OK, and without further ado, uh, let's get started. I start with the um, I start with the API of Ice and Fire and uh, Neo4j. Uh, before I forget about it, uh, so we have still ongoing our Game of Thrones um, contest. So while the season is running, uh, we encourage you to uh, do something cool with uh, Game of Thrones data and the um, and Neo4j um, and publish it, and then you uh, can uh, win a lot of cool prizes. And actually, uh, you can uh, pick your own prizes um, that you want to have uh, up to uh, I think fifty dollars or fifty euros. Uh, so please do that. And uh, already Chris and and Tomash won the first entry, so we're looking for more of that. So the things that I'm going to talk about today about is uh, also in my um, post on Medium. So if you want to read about it uh, later on, or if you want to uh, follow up and dive, dive deeper, then you find all of that uh, there as well. And actually, uh, it came about uh, because I was Googling for some uh, for some map data on Game of Thrones, and I came across this API of Ice and Fire. And um, there's someone from uh, from Sweden, Joachim who uh, built this API around the uh, Game of Thrones data. So you have uh, people and houses and uh, fellowships and who leads a house and history of a house and parental relationships and, and so on. And he saw it said, usually people go to like um, Vikia or uh, Vestras Org, uh, the uh, um, uh, Vicky of Ice and Fire uh, sites. But unfortunately, it's not so easy to get the data there with a clean, clean API. and. Uh, so what he did, he um, scraped and extracted the data and uh, put it into um, into this API that you can access from the outside. And um, that's uh, so it's from a wiki of Ice and Fire. And he has a really nice documentation around this. Uh, so you can uh, also look through the data model. Um, you can extract and, and test the um, API with, with uh, different things. and. There's enough documentation about all the uh, information in the in the data model. So, for instance, here's an um, information about the book uh, entity, and um, 
So I thought that that's really cool. So I could actually use this, this API to uh, import the data to Neo4j. Um, so if you look at an example, here's an, um, a, a character entry for character 1303, which is actually Daenerys Targaryen. And we can actually take this uh, API uh, call and just run it in our browser or with curl or whatever and get this uh, JSON back. And of course, we can also use Neo4j uh, for that. So I just spun up a, a sandbox. And now I can just say uh, call apoc uh, load uh, JSON. I pass in the URL. And then if I do this, it does the uh, request. It, oops. Uh, I pass it the URL, and it executes the request. And then I see the something's wrong with my let me just look it. So it's, Right. Okay, cool. And then I get the data back here and can uh, use that to create data. So that's how I started with all that. And uh, so what I can do here now is uh, yield the value and then I just return value dot uh, name, for instance, and value dot culture. And you can easily see that um, I can create a node from that. Uh, for instance, I create like a uh, create. Uh, a person of this name and so that's kind of how I started. So I just used the API calls to um, extract the data and then I can, uh, let's see, oh, I have more in here. Uh, then I can just uh, create nodes and so on. So that, that was pretty cool. So I, I started with that, uh, just pulling the data from the API, creating people and houses and and um, and their fellowship and, and so on, and locations and seats of houses and so on. So that was cool. But then I saw that uh, Joachim actually, uh, in his um, documentation on, on his site, also said that he has this, data, uh, this um, API on GitHub. And so I looked at, on GitHub, and um, besides the, the code, uh, so the .NET code for running the API, there's also a data directory. And then I looked into the data directory and saw, oh, there's uh, full JSON files for the, uh, for the characters and houses and books. And um, so I thought, oh, that's even better. So because then I can, uh, don't, have to go over the, um, don't have to go over the API, but can just access the uh, um, raw JSON files from GitHub directly. And that's what I ended up doing. So I um, uh, just. Uh, took the data from here. So uh, instead of uh, the API URL, I just take this raw JSON URL from, from GitHub. And then I pull the data into a, uh, using, um, using a script uh, like here. So where's my script? Here's my script. So I have a script that creates people and their relationships. Let me just show you how, how what this would look like. Um, yeah. Uh, so I just take this instance, and then I um, just clean out the old data. And uh, then I just run the script. And if you look at this, this um, loads data from, um, from this uh, GitHub URL that you saw. I just do a little bit of cleanup, because some of the uh, entries are empty and or now and, and so on. And I also want to take the turn the keys into lowercase keys, uh, so because I um, don't want to have like, have the uh, capitalized keys. And then I just create um, person, uh, create the allegiances, um, parents, spouses, for mothers and fathers. And that's when I run this code. Then it should actually um, go to GitHub, uh, pull the data, and um, do this. So that was pretty cool. So I got the data to Neo4j, which uh, which was nice. Uh, so this was the one for people, and then I had another one for uh, for the houses as well. But then I thought, hmm, now I have the data in Neo4j. j I can uh, visualize and query it, as you can as you can see here. But actually, what, what I also wanted to try to do is uh, to uh, test some stuff with our uh, GraphQL extension for Neo4j. j So I thought, why not uh, just use that to um, um, to make the data available and accessible? So what I what I did I uh, um, created a uh, a schema uh, 
for for this data set. So you see that we have uh, here seats that have relationships uh, to houses because they, they are the seat of this house. Then we have regions that contain houses. If houses with like name who founded the house, what titles does the house have, which ancestral weapons are there, coat of arms, words, and kind of the seat regions, who leads the house, uh, who founded it, and, and so on. So I turn some of the data from the JSON actually in relationship, into relationships. And for person, it's similar. Uh, so I have to name aliases, culture, uh, if it's a female character, and then um, which house they founded, if any. Uh, if uh, they lead any house, if they're an heir to a house, spouses or parents of other people, and uh, which other houses uh, they are allied with. So I just take this um, schema file and can uh, just send it to uh, our new 4 GraphQL um, API. So we have an, uh, a script that you can just install with um, uh, npm install dash g new 4 GraphQL CLI. And then you have a new for the GraphQL. Oops. New for the GraphQL um, script that you can run, and it will start a sandbox for you that actually contains the new for J uh, GraphQL extension, and also gets the uh, schema file posted directly to it. So that uh, sandbox then uh, is a full uh, GraphQL endpoint for your for your schema. So and it's currently uh, spinning up the sandbox in, as a Docker instance. And then I can um, use that. Let's see. Still spinning it up. There it is. So we are now have Neo4j GraphQL endpoint. We have a regular uh, Neo4j server there, of course. So we have a Neo4j browser here. But we also have a um, graphical uh, endpoint here that, um, that we can use uh, to interact with the database. So let's see. Uh, how well this works. Did I lose you by chance? Any chance? No. OK. And um, have, here we have our Neo4j instance. And I can just uh, take my data uh, again from here. Or I can first, uh, we can actually look at the um, messages. This is this one. Uh, call graphql.schema, and then we get a visualization, um, a graph visualization of our of our schema that I just posted to the uh, to the database. And if you remember, we have like regions and that have connections to houses. We have seats that have connections to houses. Houses have seats uh, connections to other houses, and of course, houses have connections to people, and people are connected to other people as well. So exactly what we had in the um, schema file is now available as um, as schema in Neo4j. And now I can uh, take this data, uh, this script that I just had here, and um, just run this. Um, where is it? Uh, I think this was one. Eh? So I can just run the script. Oops. Uh, I can just run the script. And while it's running, I'm copying the second script for the houses. So you might have noted, noticed that I didn't create any indexes or constraints here, but the data set is not so large. So just for demo purposes, I just quickly um, do this without indexes and constraints. But if it was for real, I would, of course, um, create some indexes on constraints on this data. OK, cool. This, this worked. Now I have all my uh, data in the uh, in database. So I can see these are the houses. We see uh, House Greyjoy and who's sworn to House Greyjoy and, and so on. Right? And um, we see also all the people that are related to it and, and, and so on. So all the Greyjoys that are in the, in the in database. So in total, I think it's. Uh, about 2,000 people or so. Um, at 2,000 people and I think um, 400 houses or so. It's quite impressive, uh, all the world that 
what George R. Martin has built here. OK, cool. Now this is our Neo4j database. But what I actually want to do is uh, also do is uh, to run uh, GraphQL against this, um, this endpoint. And what I can do now is, uh, for instance, uh, run a query this here. Where is it? Uh, here's my query. And this is a query that, um, let's see, uh, we're looking for a house, uh, which, whose name is uh, House Stock of Winterfell. We want to see the name of the house, the words of the house, who founded the house, uh, what kind of seeds does the house have, which region is it in, who follows the house, um, who does the house follow, and who follows the house. And we only want to take, take the first 10. And if you run this, then we see uh, we get this answer back. So we have winter is coming, of course, Brandon Stark. Uh, the first Brandon's dog, actually, a found in the house. And then um, Seeds was Winterfell. So you see that was a bit um, older data. And it's, of course, in the north. And here it also still follows uh, Half Baratheon, which is only partially true these days. So we could also say the same. Um, we have, for instance, a person, and we say uh, Brandon Star. And if I run. Uh, this, oops, uh, we can uh, get the name and the houses and the house's name and then um, which houses delete and so on. So you see it's, uh, so we have uh, Brandon Stark, Brandon Stark. So it's a lot of different Brandon Starks in this data set actually, not just one. Okay, and so I can create the data with GraphQL. And uh, this data is kind of interesting. So you can run a lot of uh, other queries on top of this as well. Uh, just a tool that I want to show you. One is um, if you want to see a family, you can see, uh, for instance, uh, the Baratheons. Um, then you just run uh, shortest part, uh, a pass query that says we start, started Stefan Baratheon and then go up down to all the children. Oops. <laughs> So oh, yeah, and you see that uh, some people uh, are missing. So Renly is, for instance, missing, and and, and some others as well. So Marcella and uh, for instance, also missing. Uh, so there, you see that the data is not really uh, complete. And uh, an example for finding incomplete data was here. So we can say, okay, let's find, uh, let's find some uh, people that have um, appeared in at least two different TV series, so they're more important, and that have no parent-off relationship. So they are neither parent nor, nor a child. And that's kind of, uh, for instance, uh, things where we see, OK, Walder Frey is missing, um, Marguerite Tyrell is missing, Tywin Lannister should be a parent, as we know. Um, Aya Stark's uh, relationship to, to her parents and uh, is missing. Asha Greyjoy's parent relationship is missing. So that's an easy way of, for instance, saying, OK, here's uh, data missing in the graph, and you can kind of help um, your team to extend this data set. OK, and uh, this is all, as I said, in this um, uh, post. But I also have a repository that contains uh, all, this, all this stuff as well on U4J examples with Game of Thrones. And with that, I would like to hand over to um, Tomash, uh, please, Tomash, uh, take okay. it from here. So I stop my screen share, okay, and so you should be me, able to do. Let me find where can I share my screen. Mm. There's a green arrow on the left. A green arrow on the left. Do you see that? Oh, oh I see. Okay, cool. Uh, am I sharing now? Yeah, it's all good. OK, cool. So uh, what I wanted to do for like some time now was like, I think like that most of the people that start with Neo4j starts with uh, loading CSVs into it. So to get like kind of a basic feeling like how does the Neo4j work and like the basic structure and all of that. So I was uh, like searching for some cool data uh, that I could import and like show how to load CSVs into Neo4j. So like, 
I came across a uh, Game of Thrones data on Kegel, uh, which has uh, three CSVs that contains uh, the battles and uh, and uh, data about character deaths and like which book they appear and some uh, also other stuff and titles and cultures and all of that. So I thought like that would be like a really cool uh, use case to show like how to import data from different uh, sources, like from different CSVs into Neo4j uh, and see like what obstacles uh, will uh, come about when we're doing it. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so I like made three blog posts and like each blog post was, uh, uh, was uh, was about importing uh, uh, CSV. So three CSVs, three blog posts, and like we can start like so. First, I imported the better CSV, and like we can check like the graph model, how I designed it, and uh, then uh, I just like. Uh, made like uh, I showed like how to do it so like first like I started with like just importing the battle so that we just import one node and like then we can like import data around it so like yeah, when you like uh, importing CSVs like you will <laughs> you will uh, uh, sooner or later need to find the footage trick so like the footage trick is when we have, uh, as you can see, it's when we have null values in the columns of the CSV. So like, for example, uh, Neo4j doesn't like it when you merge on a null property. <coughs> so the footage trick uh, helps us. So uh, we, we don't get like an error when, the, when we want to merge on a property that's null. And like, so as you can see, like the first uh, CSV that I imported was just like, I imported uh, data about the battles and then uh, uh, I imported like some metadata around the battles as, and you can see as like with lots of uh, CSVs, not all have like the perfect information. So some columns will be empty and so uh, mostly when we're using, uh, when we're importing non-perfect data, so like any real world data will have some null values and stuff like that. So like we can use the for each trick that just keeps the, uh, the null values in the uh, CSV, but also like we can use the coalesce. So that means like if the, if the uh, column is empty, if we give it like a default value. So like, for example, when we're creating like uh, a, a location uh, tree, like a really small, but just uh, to give an example. So like uh, we want to have like uh, uh, a static a structure. So that like, every, as you can see, every battle is placed in a location and that location is placed in a region. So if we don't, if we, for example, we only have the region, but we don't have the location, like uh, if we want to keep the graph structure, we can use the coalesce that uh, changes uh, the, the, that uh, gives the default value. So for example, if the uh, row dot location is null, just uh, use the unknown string. So for all the uh, values that will be null, we'll just create a node that says unknown. And then also, I'm, uh, we can, I showed like how to do multiple unwinds in a single query. Uh, that doesn't really happen often, but just to show you that uh, we can do that and uh, how to overcome the 
has been added to Dublin. So if you're using the unwind, unwind is like a for each function. So it increases the numbers of rows for every uh, for every uh, element in a list. And uh, so if you use the two unwinds uh, in sequence, that would mean like two for each statements in uh, and that would like uh, like multiply. So for each first uh, element, we would go to do all the elements in the second list. So uh, we can simply overcome that to correct the cardinality by just using a simple uh, of, uh, any aggregation function in between. So as you can see, I'm uh, using the unwind and then I'm merging some nodes. And when I want to end the unwind, I can just use any aggregation function. So in my case, I used the count of those uh, so that it uh, really sets the cardinality. So that was my first blog post. And then uh, maybe the second one is a bit more interesting because it shows like uh, obviously, when you're importing uh, different sources into Neo4j, like that's like the uh, the uh, uh, how do you say it? the advantage of Neo4j is that you can uh, import from different sources and uh, your life will be easy. But the downside from that is that your data has to match. So when you're working with real world data, uh, mostly <laughs> your uh, data isn't perfect. So some names will be diff different and so on. And I wanted to show like how you can uh, check uh, how, 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 mu how much do different CSV uh, match. So what you can do is uh, as you can see here, I'm just loading the CSV and I'm just uh, matching the existing houses and then I'm returning uh, how many uh, houses did it find. So how many <coughs> uh, houses from this, the second CSV match uh, houses from the first CSV. And like, what I also wanted to tell, like an, any time that you had uh, importing like separate CSVs and like on the second uh, CSV you do like you load the CSV and then the first thing you do is match that means like if uh, <coughs> if uh, it doesn't find the uh, this house already in my database then it will just keep and will it will not import data about this uh, house so like if you ask SQL user, that would uh, be like similar to inner join. So like if you want to just update uh, the houses uh, that are already in your uh, new 4 j you can just use match so that only the houses that are already in your new 4 j will be imported. And if you want to do like an outer join, then you use uh, the merge and that's, that will import all the houses that are already in and that uh, are still not in, so that uh, you will get all the data into your new J. And like I've shown like a few examples, like how to do like a case, a few case statement, statements, like how to do it in a with statement, how to do it in line. And, but as you'll see, mostly what I'm doing in this uh, importing uh, new um, Game of Thrones is like I'm using lots of footage tricks because uh, the data isn't perfect, so lots of values are missing. So what you what I ended up doing was like lots of footage uh, statements that uh, help us. Uh, uh, when uh, when the values in the columns are now. 
And uh, like, I also like did an example here. Oh, yeah, right. So when I, I when I was matching the house, like I got uh, full, uh, 414 uh, uh, houses to match. But like, you can just uh, <clears throat> when I simply uh, removed the house, so the first source had the house also so it was it wasn't just stuck it was like house stuck so uh you can like check like if you like like usually what i do mostly is like when i want my data to link more i just use the lower and trim function <clears throat> that's like really basic and sometimes you can see some old patterns like in here where i replaced the house with a uh, uh empty string so when i was just matching houses and didn't do any uh, uh parsing of the string i got 414 rows to match and when i uh, matched uh, the houses but i removed the house string from the value i got 521 rows to match so like that's mostly what you're doing when you're trying to link as, uh, different sources together and see like how you can improve uh, the linking. Okay, and so like the third, uh, the third CSV is nothing special. I for like importing stuff. It's just uh, as you can see a couple of footage tricks nothing really special like the footage tricks are really in all uh, all the <clears throat> all the posts and then like i introduced uh, a concept like a multi-labeled nodes so uh you can have uh, more loads labels on a node so that you can easily query uh, your data set so for example i uh, I added like a dead label to all the persons that we know are dead. So like when you're using like different sources, like there are different uh, uh, data that tells us who is dead and who is not. And like, I don't want to have like a really big query just so that I can find out who is dead, but like, I just want to, <laughs> to add a label that to all the persons who are dead and so that then I can actually just uh, match uh, that label and I all I get all the dead people and like similarly you can do that <coughs> for kings and knights okay hey Tomas can you really quickly uh, talk about the graph algorithms because you're kind of running out of time for you. Uh -huh. I can uh, show you the uh, what I did like from the the Joachim uh, data set that you talked about that Michael uh, was really cool to show us uh, how to import it and did all the stuff. So I took his data and I imported it so like I really just quickly want to say when doing like uh, graph algorithms, uh, you you it's easier like if you check out the this metagraph like the the relationships that point from uh, a label to the same label. So in my example, like a house is thrown to another house that uh, creates like a network of houses that are thrown to each other. So that's really cool to analyze. So I went uh, with that. So I analyzed uh, the spawn to um, network uh, from Game of Thrones houses. And it looks like this. And like what I did was I first like checked uh, uh, the connected components so i checked like uh how many houses are uh co-reachable from each other so 
I just took like the biggest petition. It was really nice because it, it was like one big petition that was that had swollen to network. So I just went with that and uh, <clears throat> did some uh, centrality. I did an analysis using centrality measures that are really cool. So what I did was I started with the basic incoming deg degree, which just means how many houses are sold to each house. And then I upgraded it with page rank. <clears throat> that is uh, really more, uh, that gives, that can give us some insights. And like uh, I used the basic for decentralized switch, uh, the page rank betweenness and uh, closeness. And I used the new uh, Neo4j graph algorithms, which are really cool and uh, yeah so i kind of did a, a few analysis like and i find out found out that this swan two network is actually from uh, the peaceful times where all of the houses were uh, swan to each other so it's not like <clears throat> so uh, interesting to see as if we had like two large disconnected components that would fight each other but still, uh, it's a really nice uh, demo of uh, graph algorithms that you can simply use with neo 4 And uh, cool. OK. Thanks so much, uh, Tomas. That was really cool. Um, Will would be next in line so uh, with me... character tensions. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Will. I'm on the developer relations team at Neo4j. Um, and the, the data set that I'm going to work with is not quite as rich as what uh, Michael and Tomas were working with. Um, instead, we're just going to be looking at a graph of character interactions. Um, by the way, this is uh, I'm just going to be working through this Neo4j browser guide, which anyone can access and, and follow along just by typing colon play and then this URL into Neo4j browser. So uh, the, the data set that I'm going to work with comes from uh, a mathematician who analyzed the text uh, of the books from the series. Uh, specifically, what he did is he looked at character names that appear within a certain distance of words uh, between each other, uh, I think about 15 words. So if you have, uh, in this case, the names Joffrey and Tyrion appearing based on, on the same page twice, uh, this would count as two interactions between Joffrey and Tyrion. So this isn't, this isn't a perfect mapping of characters that have interacted. It could be uh, one character mentioning another uh, in another context, or it, it could be even uh, another sentence not quite related, but it's a, it's a pretty good proxy measure of, of character interactions. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this data is released. Matthew Beveridge, he's the, um, I'm sorry, Andrew Beveridge, I think, is the, the mathematician uh, who released this, this data uh, in CSV files. So basically what this looks like is you have a, a source and a target and a weight. So in this case, uh, Eamon and Grin had a total of five interactions. So basically an, an adjacency list with, uh, with a weight. So we can map this to a simple uh, property graph model, something that looks like this. We'll have character nodes. We'll store the name property uh, as a string. And we'll have an interacts relationship connecting them, or we'll store the weight or the number of interactions that they had uh, as an integer. And of course, we can uh, we can import this data with just a simple uh, merge statement. Let's go ahead and, and run this. So I'm going to import all uh, character interactions. In this case, this is, I believe, from books one through five in the series. So we'll go ahead and, and run that. We also have the data uh, divided up by individual book. But um, I'm going to skip that, and we'll just look at the, the total interactions. So we can call db.schema uh, to see what this looks like. And, and basically, we have character nodes with interacts relationships that connect them. That's, that's what we expect. We can, uh, we can look at 
a large piece of the graph just to get sort of our, our bearings here. And here we can see uh, Aegon Targaryen and his, his direct interactions. Uh, we can see sort of second degree interactions through, in this case, Tywin. Okay, so that's, that's uh, sort of what we expect. Um, and what I wanted to do next was look at some different methods, things from uh, network analysis that we could do to analyze uh, this data based on just the, the structure of the network. So things like summary statistics, um, <clears throat> what's the, the minimum number of characters uh, that you've interacted with in, in the network, what's the maximum. On average, we have about five characters that any given character has, act, has interacted with, but with a pretty high standard deviation. So that, that varies quite a bit. Um, we can also look at things like the, the diameter or, or the geodesic. This is um, defined as the longest, shortest path in the network, which, uh, which we can make use of Cypher's shortest path function uh, to find this. Basically, we look at all, uh, all shortest paths between all pairs of nodes, and, and we see which one is longest. This is a, a measure of sort of how connected the graph is. And of course, shortest path is, is very useful for finding uh, the shortest path of interactions for specific characters. So here's uh, Caitlin Stark and Carl Drogo. Well, of course, uh, that has to go through Robert Baratheon since Caitlin Stark and Drogo did not interact directly. Um, pivotal nodes, this is another, another interesting concept. Um, by the way, a lot of this, uh, this network analysis uh, these ideas come from uh, a book called Networks, Crowds, and Markets. This uh, is written by John Kleinberg at, at Cornell University. Lots of really interesting network analysis ideas. Basically, a node is pivotal for two other pairs of nodes if it appears on all shortest paths uh, connecting those two nodes. So if you took that node out, there would no longer be a shortest path of, of that link connecting the other two. And again, we can make use of the the all shortest pass function in Cypher to do this comparison. This is this is a bit expensive though because we have to look at uh, all shortest paths for all pairs of users uh, in the network. Now, Tomas talked a little bit about uh, centrality measures, um, and these are these are very important for understanding which nodes are most important in uh, in the graph. We talked a little bit about uh, degree centrality, um, so we'll we'll skip that. Uh, and also, Tomas talked a little bit about uh, the Neo4j graph algorithms. Um, so we can extend the power of Cypher with user-defined procedures. There, there are a few libraries of existing procedures out there that really extend the functionality of, of Cypher, specifically around algorithms in the Neo4j graph algorithms library and also in uh, APOC. So I've, I've just installed those on my machine. You can follow these examples for getting the, the latest release. Basically, just download a, a jar file and restart Neo4j. But let's look at how we can actually uh, interpret some of these centrality measures. So between this centrality uh, is important for understanding nodes that act as bridges, nodes that sort of connect uh, two or more clusters. Um, so in this case, in this, uh, this diagram here, you can see these red nodes have a high betweenness centrality because they're uh, connecting these clusters. So let's run betweenness centrality on our graph here. So that takes just a few milliseconds. And now let's query for the characters with the highest betweenness centrality. And we can see here, uh, Stannis Baratheon has very high betweenness centrality, as well as Rob Stark and Tyrion Lannister. And if we understand uh, anything from, from the books, we can sort of have an idea of what some of these clusters uh, or communities might be in the graph. And certainly with uh, characters such as, as Tyrion uh, and Stannis that have interacted across these different groups, this, this makes sense. So between the centrality is one way of measuring uh, importance. Uh, closeness centrality is, uh, is another measure. And these are nodes that are highly connected uh, within clusters. 
we can also run this uh, run this using the Neo4j graph algorithms uh, package. But I'm going to skip uh, ahead to an IPython notebook because I think it's uh, it's really interesting and really cool that we can take advantage of Python data science tools as well uh, to work with data in Neo4j. So I'm just going to use Py2Neo to connect to uh, my Neo4j instance and these are the, the queries we saw uh, in the guide before. So I'm going to skip down to uh, the section on Python iGraph. So iGraph is uh, a Python package that includes lots of, of graph algorithms. I'm just going to uh, run this query that basically matches on my entire graph uh, and pass it into the constructor for iGraph. One thing that's really nice about PyTNeo is I can just pass my result set object directly into the constructor uh, for iGraph to instantiate uh, my graph. And now let's run uh, PageRank. So we're going to run PageRank on this in iGraph. We'll then define a query to write these values back. Uh, so we'll just match on the character and set their PageRank score. And then we can see who has the highest PageRank. Oh, Jon Snow and Tyrion and uh, Jamie Lannister had the highest page rank value. And, and this, again, I think this makes sense. Page rank is, is not just the number of characters that you've interacted with, but the number of important characters, right? So this is a, a recursive algorithm. The next thing we can do is run a community detection algorithm. Um, and we'll do this uh, just quickly here. We can do this again in, in iGraph. In this case, we'll use the walk trap method. So essentially what we want to do with the walk trap method is limit or minimize rather what's called modularity, which is the ratio of relationships that go across clusters to uh, within clusters. So we're trying to minimize relationships outside of a cluster. So this is an iterative graph algorithm. And we'll just write back a community uh, property to our nodes to group them by cluster communities that we've, uh, that we've identified. And we can query those and see, OK, here's a list of, of names in cluster 0. Um, here's the, the group in cluster 1, and, and so on. But I think visualization can really help us interpret some of these graph algorithms uh, that we've run. Let's switch over here. This, this is a, a visualization. So this is live. This just ran against, uh, against my data locally. Uh, this is a, a really simple library that I, I put together that I call uh, NeoViz. And essentially, it just bundles the JavaScript driver for Neo4j and uh, VizJS, which is a, a JavaScript visualization library. Uh, but the point is that we only have to define just some very basic configuration. And NeoViz takes care of generating the cipher and, and pulling the data from Neo4j to render our, our visualization. So here, we've colored the nodes and the relationships by, uh, by community or the clusters that we identified. The size of the node is proportional to its page rank. So we can very quickly uh, look at this and see in the green community, OK, this is, uh, these are the Night's Watch. This is uh, people from up to the wall. We can see that Jon Snow is the largest node. He has the highest page rank, so he's the most important person in this uh, community. And we can do that. Similarly, for other communities, very quickly, we can see here's uh, everyone around Daenerys. She has the largest uh, node, so she's the most important person in this community. So uh, the point here, I think, is that just in addition to running these algorithms, uh, it's important to have some visualization tools to be able to, uh, to make sense of them and interpret them uh, as well. So that's all I uh, wanted to say. Um, and so with that, I think we can pass it over to uh, Christoph. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, that was really cool. I also shared your links uh, in the uh, online chat for the uh, for the YouTube live, so people can follow on. Cool, Chris, Great. off to you. Hi. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, perfect. All right, so hi, everybody. I'm Chris from GraphRive. Um, I actually took a very different approach. So we imported the Game of Thrones text books as raw text actually into Neo4j. So you can see here that so I created the import script in Python. 
So we import chapter notes, and for each chapter, there is a paragraph note with its associated text. So the goal is to uh, process those texts with NLP pipelines. So the most basic operation is to annotate the text, so it will do uh, tokenization, lemmatization, uh, removing stop words, etc. So we have a NLP framework which provides a set of procedures. Uh, so it is very easy, as you can see, to uh, process the text. So I will process some here. And so it actually, you have the possibility to uh, separate your original graph, so your, te your text nodes, with the NLP extraction. So if we take the NLP extraction, you can see that it creates sentence nodes. And for every sentence, it creates a tag occurrence node and a tag node. So the difference is that tag are, are like uh, improved tokens. Uh, so here, Lord, Stark, have, but it is the root version of the word. So for example, um, uh, arrive, it could be that in the text, it would be arrived with uh, a verb version. And the occurrence is, so the occurrence of this tag in the sentence. So because we have unique tags in all the database, but we play with occurrence because the tag can of course appear in multiple sentences. So we have context aware tag uh, representation. Um, so once this is, um, this extraction is done, so you can actually uh, run some um, useful queries. So for example, um, you can find some uh, concepts fun. So uh, one of the features that Stanford or OpenNLP has in the framework is that it can do named entity recognition. So in the text, you can see that it recognized John all this as person and some entities as a location, etc. So if you want to actually have a, a better understanding of how it looks like in a text, so let's say this was a paragraph here. Um, if I take this one, it is split it into question, uh, for, uh, into sentence, for example, uh, sorry. And for each sentence, it tokenized the text and do name entity recognition. So here we can find that it found a time entity, a number entity, but also, which is more useful. Here, those are person entities from actually. So Edward Stark, Tion, and uh, Rob. Um, so this will actually lead to um, other useful things you can do um, with a graph-based NLP extraction is that, for example, be, you can find the interactions uh, between people in the sentences, oh. uh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, so I create actually the the interaction based on the number of times it appears in the sentence. So you can see here that uh, let's take the value instead. Right. So we can say that Halle Smolton occurs with Rob in the same sentence one time. Um, let's take this here, the frequency. So here, Robert and um, Targaryen appeared in the same sentence twice, etc. So this is another way to build interaction graphs uh, based on um, text extraction, actually. So the uh, third thing we can do is finding, for example, lady, queen, and lords based on uh, the text. So well, the idea is just that we match a token or a tag which contains lord or queen or king or lady. And then because we have those tag occurrence, we can say, okay, find the token before, the token after, and if it is, um, uh, if it has a value, return this uh, as possible, lord, queen, etc. So you can say that here we have lady, king, queen, lord, etc. Um, fourth thing is, 
um, finding locations and people. Um, again, location of people. So this is based on the name identity recognition, again, which is not always perfect, of course, because it depends a lot of the context and how the sentence is understood by um, natural language processing tools like Stanford or uh, OpenNLP. Um, you can also do your own um, name identity recognizer, but it is out of scope of uh, here. Um, then one of the interesting, most interesting thing actually that we did uh, a while ago was the entity merging. Because if you look at the sentence, um, the sentence might might contain, for example, uh, Sir Garrett, but it can be sometimes just Garrett or Sir Garrett and another um, name, for example. So we actually can find all the tags that looks like together. So the the query is a bit more complicated, of course, but I wrote a blog post uh, uh, about it. So we find uh, all the names, and then um, uh, we find the possible um, matches. So I will just show what it looks like here. So let's uh, take them. OK. So we can say, OK, here, Robert. The possible other names are Robert Baratin, Robert of the House Baratin. So we will actually merge, not merge, but create new entities with saying that those persons are aliases of the longest one, actually, etc. So once we create those results, it gives you a um, graphs like this. Uh, right, so Sir Bariston Selmy is known as Sir Baniston, but also Sir Bariston Selmy. Um, Sir Yora Mormont is now known as Sir Yora. Um, and here, Alistoton is known as Alistoton, and also as Sir Alistoton, uh, etc. So, uh, this was uh, already uh, useful. You can also merge this uh, data with other data set, but it is sometimes a bit more complicated because uh, the concepts are not the same, but the idea I wanted to go further is creating actually a possibility of question question answer system on the data set based on NLP. So one way of doing that is, for example, when you create a question, um, you apply the same NLP uh, pipeline. So let's take a question here. So for example, who Mormon said to track, and then uh, you actually apply it. Then you have the same structure, sentence, tag occurrence, tags, and then uh, oh, here, tags, and then you find actually the original text having the same tags in common, etc. So this works with small text, but this is really not accurate enough. So we went further with our NLP framework, and we implemented like dependencies. So if you look a set for for example, you can find that um, there are subjects, there are objects, etc. in the sentence that can be found. So we implemented this in the framework, which actually you can recreate these type dependencies in the graph. So you can say, OK, here the sentence, Mormon said, we should as we should track them and we did garrett said so you you have the, the root actually of the sentence which is say and then subject one of the subject is moment um and uh, the composition goes to track so here so actually you can recreate a kind of subject subject verb object of the graph so i started to look at this um but it's not easy so there are some paper right where it assumes that um, you can do actually finding common subgraph, but it does it does a lot of assumption actually on the quality of the relationship. So you always have a subject, you always have an object, etc. Which actually, when you parse text, which is not always the case. So here it is fine. You have object, subject, and root. But in the real world, 
generally the subject or the object might be a composition of other relationship. So we are actually trying to find a common ways of being able to extract subject verb objects uh, from the graph. And so we, for example, I tried the FP growth algorithm, so which return my common patterns before the subject or the object. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So the, we are near a concrete solution. Um, and I will present um, this solution on 28th of September of the Neo4j online meetup. Um, in the meantime, so this database actually is available uh, as read-only uh, database uh, on the internet. So I will share the, uh, oh, the, the link here. Uh, So you can actually um, go to this database. Um, and yeah, so I'm writing, there will be a blog post about our findings, about finding lexical patterns uh, for being able to actually uh, regenerate actions uh, from the text. So if you look at the graph here, you can actually regenerate, okay, subject, moment, uh, action, say to track, and object, it will be them, so they. Um, but this will also be recognized with the previous sentence to be another a person or a group of person. Uh, so the next goal is to be able to generate those actions, to be able to help in the chat chatbots or question answer system uh, with graph. So, and graph are very helpful here, because when you look at Stanford, this is actually a graph. So uh, you cannot have better structure. Thank you. Could you hear me? Well, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, I, I was just uh, trying to find my unmute button. <laughs> cool. That, that's really, really cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to your presentation on the 28th, uh, which takes me uh, to the end of our session. So here are the next online meetups. Uh, so Will will talk actually this week on Thursday about creating graphs with GraphQL. So that will be really interesting because he goes much further than what I showed in terms of building a, a GraphQL uh, server that talks to me for general background and serves in React app in the, in the front end. Uh, Mark and Jesus will talk about uh, analyzing football data with Neo4j, especially transfer data. So you know where all the millions of euros and, and dollars are spent. Um, and then uh, Jonathan Freeman on September 14th will look at uh, Instacart data. That's also data that has been published, I think, via Kaggle, which is um, lots of orders of online grocery shopping and what kind of insights you can draw from this kind of data. So it's also data analytics talk. And then, as Chris mentioned, he'll present on September 28th, uh, building conversational experiences with Alexa and uh, Jay. So lots of good stuff. Um, if you have more questions, feel free to ask them either on the uh, 